Welcome to another video. Today we have Changer, Changer versus Changer. Changer. And in this corner weighing in at 12 tapes and 9 hours of playing times, the original from 1970, the Denon Casamatic. How many tapes? 12. Oh, 12. And in this corner we have the Challenger. Weighing in at only 6 tapes in the Changer and one on the side is the Pioneer CTWM 62R from 1992. <laughs> Well, actually, this video is mostly going to be about the Pioneer Cassette Changer. We already did a video on the Denon last year. You can check out our channel if you want to see that. But it is interesting to compare these two changers since they have the same basic purpose but were 20 years apart in time. So let's just start with some overall comparisons of the styles of these two changers. The Denon is very much a product of the 60s with the silver wood grain and the fact that you can just... Like get... if you play this at a party. Yeah, well, yeah, that's what it's for. But... This design makes perfect sense to somebody who's used to seeing the internals of a record changer in a jukebox and really getting hands-on. It's a very mechanical device at its core. The tapes are right there under the bubble, just exposed to you, and you get to, get to be part of the whole process. Whoop -de -doo. The Pioneer, on the other hand, is all about electronics and computerization. In the 20 years between these two machines, consumers have witnessed a personal computer revolution. When robots take over, it's going to end up like the Terminator. The CPU is a neural net processor. A learning computer. Well, hopefully not, but the Pioneer is clearly targeted to an audience who wants computer control. We send the tapes away in a drawer, trusting the high-tech computer to do its job and not bothering us with the details. Very much a product of and for the computer and digital era. Because of that, like any 80s electronics product, we have tons of flashing lights. There are literally hundreds and thousands of blinking, beeping, and flashing lights. Blinking and beeping and flashing. They're flashing and they're beeping. I can't stand it anymore. They're blinking and beeping and flashing. Why does this so, blip, blip, blip. Well, there aren't, there are no beeping, but th there is a lot of flashing lights. This is actually the demo mode. I think the purpose of this is just to actually make all the lights flash and, you know, show you some, some of the features and uh, of the tape deck. Feature-wise, the Pioneer incorporates almost every sound quality and, and tape transport enhancement added to the cassette format over the past 20 years that preceded it. It's got metal. It's got Dolby B, Dolby C, HX Pro, Auto Reverse, Music Search, Time Counter. Um, the Denon, on the other hand, is very Spartan. No noise reduction, normal tapes only, non-locking, fast-forward, and rewind. And while the Denon holds more cassettes, the fact that it does not do auto-reverse and can't reset itself means it can't ever play more than nine hours without intervention. But the Pioneer, in theory, could just play forever if you uh, just have it on continuous repeat. But before we leave the Denon completely and focus on the Pioneer, it's worth noting two features it has that the Pioneer does not. One is individually adjustable record levels, and the other is a microphone jack. But really, the Pioneer is more about digital and easy access to your existing cassettes. It came out in the middle of the CD era, but before home CD burning was economical. So it's all about uh, the audience who needs to access and use the music they have on cassette. One feature that's kind of cool for a tape deck is randomize. Uh, we're used to seeing that in the digital music world. What it does here is it just goes to a random tape, plays till it hears silence, and goes to another. It's pretty cool and... Uh, with only about a 10 second delay between songs, it's actually pretty usable. Another cool feature that's activated when you double click this button is the All Rewind feature. So if you need to rewind six cassettes to get ready for that road trip, just put them in the machine and let it do the work. And you can still listen to a cassette on the other deck while it rewinds. So here we finish rewinding tape one, and then we're gonna load tape two and rewind it and so forth until they're all rewound. So the next feature is almost a requirement of a cassette changer in the 90s that wouldn't have been in the 70s. Notice this variety of tapes I've got loaded here. Some are metal, some are normal bias, one's pre-recorded and write protected. The tape deck can read all that information from those tabs, but what it can't read is the Dolby noise reduction setting. So this has a feature called noise reduction memory. The way it works is you set a uh, Dolby noise reduction uh, setting for each tape by punching the cassette numbers and you know I'm setting type B there and then I'll set type C. Uh, if you didn't have this feature, it would be kind of pointless to preload all these tapes and have to remember to go back and change the noise reduction uh, during the playback. So, so I imagine they would have liked to automate this feature, but it's not really possible. Also interesting that they use the VU meter LEDs that double as indicators for uh, setting noise reduction on or off. So next up, we've got this really weird display with dots, lines, and in-hub and L-hub. I looked at this and I thought, what in the heck does it mean? It's like in a foreign language. I was really dumbfounded. 
He doesn't know how to use the three seashells. <laughs> what I is... think it's alien. No, it's not aliens. It's tape remaining indicators. So this is trying to show you how close you are to the end of the tape. See, only that main longer line is flashing, so you're near the beginning. But if you flip the tape over, then only the uh, last couple of ones are flashing. You're near the end. And, of course, the very end, only one's flashing. This is just a consequence of not being able to see the reels. The uh, tape is locked away in the changer, so you got to have some way to gauge this while you're making a recording. In hub, hub and L hub is for normal hub and large hub cassettes only have normal hub. And also the precision doesn't actually increase until the very end of the tape, so hence the longer bar. I think it's just measuring the drag on the tape reels. That's why you have to have the N hub, L hub ways to read it. We even tried to fool it with this cassette single, which has very little amount of tape in it, but it only lit up the uh, last indicator, so... I guess it's just uh, measuring the tape just to kind of give you some idea of you're getting near the end, don't try to record a long song. The final feature we're going to talk about is CD Deck Synchro, which enables just one touch recording of a CD to tape. And it actually requires a separate cable. There's a little mini jack cable around back that you link the tape player to the CD player. And this is separate from another cable that routes the remote control infrared signal, but it's a special feature. And uh, what you do is you just punch the button. This is my PD5500 CD player we uh, featured in another video. Notice I punched the button, it started recording, it records for about 10 seconds, then the CD player will start automatically. And the reason is it's trying to let you get past the leader tape. And you can also use this in conjunction with the sort of Compu program edit features of the CD player that we talked about earlier in another video. So I've always wondered about those electronics recycling centers. This is where this came from. Uh, it was advertised as being dropped off at an e-cycling center. I've always wondered if you could get something there. You can see the door doesn't close. And here's what it did when I first turned it on. Well, no, it didn't blow up. It made a motor noise and then stopped and it came up with this error message. Error, error. Yeah. I, I kind of jumped the gun here. I took the top off and looked inside and what did I see? A rat. No, it wasn't a rat. So when I saw this belt wasn't turning, I thought, oh, the belt's slipping. That'll be an easy fix. Unfortunately, I should have looked a little bit harder. Oh, no. So I, re I, I had to get to, the, get to the belt. You know, basically that whole changer unit is, will come out. But anyway, I, I managed to get that little gear out. So I get the belt out. I replaced the belt. And in the process of placing the belt, I turned the gear and moved it back a little bit. And after that, it would actually move it. But the... Uh, but it wouldn't stop, and the reason was it's a switch. That cable also got pulled tight. Uh, as I soon discovered, somebody else has been inside this thing, and they incorrectly routed that white cable. It's supposed to go through. Did that happen in another video? I guess before they dropped it off at the e-recycling center, they, they, they hastily put it back together. Anyway, as it turned out, the switch that stopped the transport wasn't getting stopped. If I triggered the switch which I just t taped a piece of paper to the uh, stopper thing so that it would actually trigger the switch. And at that point, it started working, but it still wouldn't play a tape. It would move the head, the mechanism back and forth, but it wouldn't play a tape. There are no shortcuts. I'm going to have to take this thing out, which was a pain. So you have to take off the front and then get that entire changer mechanism out. And once I got it out, it was uh, there wasn't a lot you could get to on the bottom. And the uh, manual talked about, you know, lots of disassembly, Lots of desoldering. I mean, it looked like a pain. It looked like it was going to be a multi-day process, but... Two at, days later. You know, no, actually, I, there was a shortcut. So uh, as, I also saw this. That thing was not put back together. I, eventually, I realized somebody else had been inside this thing and just hastily put it back together, and they messed up this white thing. There's the uh, the cassette mechanism sort of detaches from the end of the changer mechanism there. That's how that works if you, if you need to get to that. Anyway, one thing I ran into... When looking at this was the those uh, little gray things, when they push down and you turn the gear, that's what actually moves the tape in and out. So by manually working that, I, I suddenly realized, wait a second, uh, there's no nothing that looked like it was lining up to press those gray things. Nothing looked like it was lining up to press those gray things for some reason. Then I noticed when I had it on its side, this little piece here was loose. And so basically what had happened is whoever took this apart, I think just got that off the track. So I popped that guy back into the track so that it could go over those little gray switches. And uh, between that and making sure the switch would actually stop, I don't even think I needed to re re uh, replace the belt. I think uh, those two things actually made it work. So once I got that back on track, uh, here's what happened.
So you know, it switched on. Yeah, it's playing. That's it. So now it, it, it's working. First time I got it to play back, it worked great. So there's the tape mechanism running. Uh, everything seemed to be working fine with the changer at this point. It will, you know, unload a tape and uh, load another tape. There, you know, it, unload, it unloads the tape that's playing. Uh, well, I thought it would. It unloads the tape that's playing and loads the other one that, that you want to play back in and just brings it up to the tape deck. There was my fix. I just sort of like clamped a piece of heat shrink tubing and that sort of fixed that problem. Yay! See how that is grounded. This deck was not grounded. I don't know whoever took this apart before maybe didn't reconnect the ground wire. So when you play it, you get a buzz. <laughs> unless, you Bees, run unless you ground it. So I did add a ground wire there and that fixed that problem. But uh, uh, it really didn't take long to fix this thing, maybe an hour or two. And uh, the circuit uh, inside I found to be, you know, pretty well laid out and well labeled on the electronic side, even though it was a big pain to disassemble. There's a Sony chip inside the Pioneer and of course the big Pioneer computer chip. So in conclusion, was it worth it? Yes. I mean, I would have loved to have this machine back in the heyday of cassettes, but look at this, for example, this counter, notice we only have one counter that's overridden by the last tape you put in. It's a very clever deck in a lot of ways because it has to pack everything into such a small area with all the buttons though. For uh, typical users, it might sacrifice a little bit of usability. As far as the model itself, there was not a lot of information available on the 62. There was this ad from 1993, but in general all I could find was the 60, which was mid-range, up from the 50, down from the 70. I think changers, uh, tape changers in general did not do well because, you know, a 90-minute tape is actually a pretty decent amount of time. And cassettes are a format that is designed to be easy to swap out and manage individually. Well, anyway. That's all. Thanks for watching. See you next time for another video.